Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where more bad news for the millennials. Way more bad news for the millennials. You're set to become, according to some research published by the Research Foundation think tank, um, that you will be the first generation in history, potentially, unless things change quickly and soon, to earn less than your predecessors, to earn less than your parents. <laughs> Uh, the figures are, uh, I mean, it's close, but you'll earn, at the moment, it looks as if you've earned about eight grand less during your 20s than a typical person in the previous generation. That's my generation, Generation X, 35 to 55. You're a millennial, under 35. Uh, I don't know how that's happened, but you're about to tell me. 03456060973 is the number you need. Um, the question really couldn't be simpler. How do you think this has happened? Let, let's run through some of the obvious answers. You can start shouting immigration in answer to almost every question on the table in British politics at the moment. And, and um, uh, you could even quote bogusly and erroneously from that Bank of England report that allegedly reported that wage compression was commonplace as a result of immigration. The Bank of England report did nothing of the sort, but of course that didn't stop the usual suspects to uh, use it to tell you lies. Um, this applies right across the board. So th this applies Applies from the top of the earning ladder right down to the bottom. Charles Corrin, who, who uh, nobody got the violins out in response to this piece, wrote, wrote an article about 18 months ago in the Times about how somebody like him, i.e. Uh, a very successful newspaper columnist on the telly, TV shows, book deals, all that sort of thing, would 20 or 30 years ago have been expecting um, a standard of living that, that simply isn't there anymore. And, and he was comparing himself to his dad, the famous editor and humorist Alan Corrin, and, and saying, you know, I don't want to misrepresent because I haven't read the article for two years, but I think he was essentially saying, yeah, I'm not doing badly, I, I'm, I'm doing almost as well as my dad did, and yet my dad's earning potential was way, way higher than mine. And, uh, well, as I say, I'm not expecting anyone to get a violin out as a result. I do think it's worth examining, because that's, that's a newspaper column, because my, my default position on things like this is to reach for employment law and trades unions and the erosion of workers' rights. But that doesn't apply to people like me, really, or people like him, or people who look at their income and think, yeah, I'm doing a hell of a lot better than most of my mates, but I'm still not doing as well as I would have done if I'd been in this profession at this level 20 years ago. I always think of that row of houses in Bray, in Buckinghamshire, where the late Terry Wogan used to live. I don't think you could make enough money, unless you're Chris Evans, maybe, and you made it from selling a company. I don't think a Sir Terry Wogan-style broadcaster who's only ever earned an income from other companies rather than been buying and selling companies... I don't think he could ever aspire to living in those sort of circumstances now by doing this for a living. Obviously, in, in Sir Terry's case, on a way, 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 way higher scale than I ever will. But you see my point. It, 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 you look at, certainly in London or, or, or wherever you live, the smartest parts of town do not seem within the reach of ordinary workers. Even if you become the boss, even if you become the best in the business, you're not going to be able to buy that house up there because it's 25 million quid. So there's a weird redistribution of wealth that uh, that I can't quite unpick. I really can't. I don't quite get it. I recognise it. I recognise the reality of what's being described. And I know there's not going to be any easy catch-all answer as to how this has been allowed to happen. But if you see the history of, of British workers on a graph going back to 1800, and the graph has, with every generation, been on an upward gradient in terms of what you would earn compared to the generation before you, the fact that we are now living in a period where it's about to go down for the first time ever ever is surely worthy of uh, a little bit more consideration also I, I do find and if you're new to the program as a, as a lot of people are you you probably picked up on this before you picked up on anything else P people do tend now we do share confidences with each other don't we and we do we do provide a little view on the world from perspectives other than our own and and you know i can do my bit on that but it's a tiny tiny little bit compared to compared to you uh, and and what it feels like to know you're going to earn less than you or to look at your life and think I'm actually I'm actually not going to build upon what my parents have done I, I'm, I'm going to fall slightly short of what my parents have done the general truth is that you will do better than your mum and dad it's not always going to be true for goodness sake that would be stupid of course and, and, and it, it rules out exceptionality it rules out or it ignores people who are 
who are, you know, possessed of particularly gifted parents or particularly gifted children. There are always going to be exceptions to this rule. But the general trend has always been that you will do better than your parents, financially. Why does that general truth, why is that general truth, why has that general truth suddenly become untrue in this country at this point in our history? Okay? So have a crack at it from your own perspective as you look up the ladder and see your parents on a rung you think you'll never reach. Just tell me why. 0345 6060 973. But also, the, the, the bigger picture, the broader issues, the broader trends, what do you think explains it? What do you think explains it? I, I think part of the problem is the fact that because immigration has dominated the national conversation for the last 10 years now, all the real reasons why people are being left behind, all the real reasons why people are doing worse than they should be, all the real reasons why the rich are getting richer while everybody else is getting poorer have been very, very conveniently ignored. Every time you say, well, why aren't you earning as much as you should be? Someone else in the, will whisper in your ear, immigrants, immigrants. What they won't do is whisper in your other ear, well, your boss is actually worth three times more than they were two years ago, so part of the reason why you're not getting paid enough is because he's just bought his third Bentley. No one ever does that. That makes you a champagne socialist or uh, a partitioner, a practitioner of the politics of envy or a, or a, or a no-good li liberal. You point out that bloke over there who pays your wages is richer than he's ever been, and the gap between what he earns and you earn is bigger than it's ever been. But the reason why you're not earning enough? Immigrants. That's a big part of it for me. Uh, these people who've got rich and famous telling you to blame all the problems in your life on immigration, while actually the problems in your life are caused by, well, many, many more and more complicated issues. So why, when you look up the ladder to where your parents are sitting, do you fear that you're never going to get there? And let's do the parental angle as well, because this could be very interesting. Because you look, you, you, the only life you almost live as closely as your own is the life of your child. You, you heard the last caller before the news there, who's clearly suffering just as much as his daughter is from the fact that his daughter's being bullied. So you look at your child's life and you don't quite get it. Why? Well, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. They've obeyed all the rules, they've ticked all the boxes, they did everything they were supposed to do, but they're not going to do as well as me. So when you look at your son or your daughter and you arrive at this very uncomfortable conclusion, what answers are you coming up with as to why it is? 0345 If the current trend continues, you're looking at lifetime earnings in the region of about £825,000. This is the average. Whereas for the previous generation, it would be about £832,000. Don't ask me to explain the maths to you. Just respond to the findings and answer the question of why. Why do you think this would happen? Seriously. There may be some positive answers. There may be some optimistic analyses that allow us to think it's temporary. But right now, in Britain, for the first time in history, you're going to be worse off than your parents. Why is that? 03456060973. Root is in Stafford. Root, what would you like to say? Uh, yeah, so I actually am one of the optimists that you just mentioned, saying oh, temporary. And I'm going to explain this um, quite simply, <laughs> that we are in a transition period between the older economy and the newer economy that is more based on services and less on ownership, and more based on um, renewables, more based on circular economy. And while we're going through this transition period, we can't ignore the fact that the older market is, in fact, saturated. So everything that could have been there is already there. Yes, globalization has to do with it but it's part of a bigger issue what, what is the and older because, you need to translate some of this for me what is the older economy what, what are we talking about there? like manufacturing and things like that exactly so that's the older economy and uh, the newer economy is more based on services so it's product versus service and since if you look at our resources and how we've used them we've reached that point where now we have to change so there is um you know there's all sorts of different types of ketchup. There's all sorts of books. You can get anything anywhere. So now you need less resources to make that, and that's where we start cutting. We're not growing this was gonna, you said You said this was going to be simple. Oh, uh, well, it is simple. We're just not growing quite <laughs> as much as we used to. So 20 not, years, you know, 20 years down the line, older. 20 years down the line, what? if my daughter wants to earn as much as I earn, what sort of job will she be doing? Um... 
probably more of a service type job. But what does that mean? So there was a service. There was there was a survey by Softcat done this year that showed that actually um, the jobs that um, new graduates will be fighting for from now have not even been imagined yet, like not created in any similar manner. So I'm not a fortune teller and I'm, I'm definitely well, well, not... you are, because you, you came on to tell us that things would get better quickly as soon as the old economy was replaced by the new economy, but now you're telling us that you can't... I never said the word quickly. Well, well eventually then, okay, even, eventually is fine. Optimistically, this problem would actually solve itself. That usually um, changes in, in, in history did not happen quite as fast as they happen nowadays. This is but you can't, I can't, you know, I, I mean, you can talk all day, but when I say to you, what do these jobs look like? And you say, well, nobody knows. That's the point at which optimism goes out the window. Oh, that depends on your perspective. You can decide that something that you don't know is better than what you have or worse than what you have. I can't tell you. I decide to think it would be better. Even though you don't know what it is? Well, since definitely lack of resources causes us to be a lot more um, efficient in our use and it creates an economy that's more circular I would like to believe that we would have cleaner, fresher air, better energy But you don't know what job health. you'll be doing? No nope. Okay that's, that's glass half full, right there I know, I know, and I admire you. I don't, I don't want to seem as if I'm not, but I, I would need to know. I would need to know what that job looked like before I could be confident that it was a job I wanted to do, and indeed that would pay more than the job I'm currently doing. Twelve fifteen is the time. I feel like I've rained on road parade. I really do. If you want to help mop up, you know what to do. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. Something's shifted. All right. And life has not got worse for the people at the very top of the pyramid. It has got almost immeasurably better. And I appreciate that thanks to Mr. Murdoch and other friends in the media, we as a nation have been successfully persuaded that it's perfectly acceptable for the rich to get richer while everybody else gets poorer. And you add into that the fact that the reason why everybody else is getting poorer has nothing to do with all the people getting richer. It's got everything to do with the people who clean your house or polish your car or who come here from Eastern Europe in search of an income. That's why That's why. Your life's rubbish. Nothing to do with all the people who are getting richer and richer and richer and ordering yachts every week. That's absolutely clear. I can't help thinking it might just be the other way round. And the reason why everybody is poorer than their parents is because of that tiny number of people at the top of the pyramid who are rich beyond even their parents' wildest dreams. It's 1216. This from Ruth is... Well, I'm going to give you two contributions. We're trying to answer the question of why the current generation under 35s are going to be the first ever to learn less than their predecessors, their parents. And there are two answers here. One depresses the hell out of me, and one also depresses the hell out of me, but for very different reasons. This is the one that depresses the hell out of me for reasons that you could describe as palatable or positive. She says, Ruth says, I think it has something to do with the fact that the difference between the lowest earner in a company and the highest is now incredible. I read Why I Write by George Orwell and it was so depressing because back in 1944 he was saying that the difference should be about nine to one, i.e. that the highest earning member of a staff should earn about nine times what the lowest member of staff earns. Now it's about a hundred to one or more. And it's true, just look at a bank, you'll see someone taking home five, six million quid and there'll be somebody on the shop floor or, or, or on the cashier's desk at that bank who's earning 17 or 18 thousand pounds. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible, that, that difference. And that, for me, is one of the big things that somehow we've allowed to happen. For Dave, it's because the top people can't pay indigenous people more than immigrants even if they wanted to. So Dave has been successfully persuaded that the reason why he perhaps is not earning as much as he should is because he's, as an indigenous person, he can't get paid more than an immigrant gets paid. And Dave, mate, that is, uh, you might as well punch yourself in the face all day for all that logic's going to get you. Why, why can't you see it this way? Because companies can get away with paying too little because we don't have any union representation. Instead of looking at the country of birth of the person sitting next to you, and you look for a higher wage for both of you which is, of course, where the trade unions would historically come in. But, of course, there's no point for trade unions if you think that country of birth is a better indicator of how much you should earn than actual ability to do a job. Dave, mate, come on. Tim's in Bristol. Tim, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Oh. Um, I, um, yeah, I, my father and I have both taken very similar career paths. Yeah. Um, he was a project manager... Um, and he's worked his way up, um, and he's now a director of operations at an energy company. Uh, yeah. He took a energy company route. Um, I'm in financial services. 
um, I've gone straight to the university, he didn't have a degree, um, and uh, I'm doing project management now, and I, I really can't see how I could go from where I am to where he is, and there's a few contributing factors to that. One, I think um, pr progression is uh, harder internally. Um, people my age don't see a reason to stick with a company for a long term. Why not? Um, well, I think one thing to do with it is final salary pension schemes don't exist anymore. Yes. Um, you hear you hear it all over the office. The people on final salary pension schemes are quid in, happy to stay for a long time. Um, whereas for us, I think you don't have that long term commitment from the organisation, so it's more likely that you would bounce around in order to try and raise your salary all the time. Um, yeah, so I think every couple of years or so is the sort of standard expectation. But you're not um, going to raise your salary by doing that to the level that your father achieved. No, absolutely not. The thing that sort of I get a bit miffed about, I suppose, is that, um, like, if I have children now with my girlfriend, um, we certainly wouldn't be able to provide our children with the quality of life my father's been able to provide me. And that, um, that's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. Because you've done everything by the rules. You, you, you know, it's not like you've spent your 20s trying to be a rock star. No, no, I thought, yeah, I did a very, well, vanilla sort of approach of school, A-levels, uni. Um, played the game, played the game by the rules and you're going to end up worse off than your dad. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I well, I mean, it's, it's no really consolation is. to you, but but you, that is typical for your generation. You're under 35, are you, Tim? I, I'm 23, yeah. Yeah, so, so that is typical for your generation. I look, I, I, I want to pin down the why, because you've given me the what, not the why. The, the, the moving around the final pa pa salary pension schemes, all of that makes absolute sense. But the reason, surely, has got more to do with, and uh, do people talk about trickle-down economics, it's just not trickling down, it's actually closer to the truth, isn't it? The people who run your company, where you're doing project management or, 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 or whatever you're doing, they're still going to be earning fortunes, the actual owners and shareholders, but the people doing the legwork, the foot soldiers, are earning less than ever before. That's political. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's extraordinarily... Um like the, the difference between the guy at the top and myself is, is humongous and there's people below me even who perhaps haven't gone to university and aren't doing nearly as well as I have I mean it showed through the other day just after the, the Brexit thing um, people were investing in shares heavily um, straight after um, and they've all added vast amounts of money to their uh, bank balances since um, by, din by dint of having money to invest in the first place to, yeah, to, to capitalise on the weak pound sat there with all the right ideas but unable to uh, Didn't have do the it capital. as well. See, so, that's, I'm, I'm going to put that on the list as well. I, I can't remember which Dickens book it is. Someone will remind me. Uh, someone will probably remind me already before I've even said it out loud, such is the nature of, 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 of Twitter at the moment and correcting mistakes. The, 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 the capital, it's all about capital. You need to have capital. If you've got capital, you're going to be fine. But I, I guess what we're describing now is a generation that's going to have less capital than ever before. Money to invest. Property. Capital. Oh, dear. I, I hesitate to continue this conversation. It's so depressing. Luckily, Theo Usherwood is here to cheer us up. LBC's political editor is still absorbing the seismic shift in our political landscape. What have you turned up today, Theo? Yes, I've got a bit of a funny for you today, James. We all know about the Big Brother house. Well, we're now going to have the Brexit house. What? Uh, yes, Chevening near Seven Oaks. It is the official residence of uh, the official country residence, I should say, of the Foreign Secretary. But Boris Johnson is going to have to share it with David <laughs> Davis, <laughs> the Secretary of State for Brexit, and Dr. Liam Fox, uh, uh. the Secretary of State for International Trade. Who says Theresa May, our new Prime Minister, does not have a sense of humour? It's quite a warped sense of humour. So, what, how are they going to do it? Will they have a rotor? Will they have to bagsy it in advance? Or will they all turn up together with their competing entourage? Uh, well, there is a very good question about whether they'll have some sort of list on the wall and they'll fill in the chart when they've got it uh, when, when each of them wants to have a pool party. Uh, but the 17th century uh, mansion uh, does have 115 rooms so they could all stay with their uh, dignitaries at once and there is uh, a leisure park in the grounds plenty of uh, time if they want to farm one out to go and entertain um, some guests but on a serious note we do have some more details James Good. about Theresa May's uh, visit to Europe this week so it's actually going to turn out to be it's looking like two visits Wednesday evening it's uh, dinner with Angela Merkel uh, the German Chancellor in uh, Berlin and she is of course crucial to Britain's any eventual deal to leave uh, the European Union from what we understand 
Article 50 is going to be parked uh, in a corner and it's just going to be about opening talks, what could feasibly be done and what could feasibly not be done. Uh, and then it will be back to London after that working dinner before a th further visit on Thursday evening to Paris to the Elysee Pas Palace to see uh, President Francois Hollande. That visit much more focused on security following uh, the, terror attacks in, uh, in the terror attack in Nice last week. Indeed. So when you say parked in the long grass, you, you mean there's a lot of preparatory work that needs to be done before they can press the button? Uh, it depends, of course, who you speak to, because, of course, David Davis, the Secretary of State for uh, Brexit, was saying at the weekend that he thought that he, he, he wants uh, Article 50 to be triggered. Uh, well, it would have to be triggered by the end of this year if that two-year process was to be completed by the end of January 9, 2019, which is when he wants to see uh, Britain leave the European Union. Theresa May, on the other hand, says she doesn't want it uh, triggered by the end of this year. She, she believes it's actually going to take quite a long time. And what, what Downing Street is saying is that they want a deal, uh, you know, uh, put forward, basically, you know, that they know what uh, Brexit will actually look like before they sign up to it and before they trigger uh, Article 50. And it'll be very interesting when we look ahead what that actually entails and what happens if we don't get uh, the deal, Britain doesn't get the deal uh, that, that, uh, that, that's actually right for the country and whether there's actually Downing Street says, well, hang on a moment, should Brexit really mean Brexit? Should we really uh, trigger Article 50? The wriggle room, in other words, is being created, James, that, and that's looking further ahead. So if Theresa May has to say to the country, look, this is the best deal on the table and I, as your Prime Minister, have to tell you it will be worse off than we were before... Is that on the yeah, card? Uh, yeah, abso absolutely. So you're, you're going... Uh, do you uh, want to have a general election, or do you want to... I mean, uh, God forbid, another referendum. Two, two, quick point, two, yeah. two quick points. Firstly, you're going to have... One option is going to be wholesale leaving the European Union yeah. uh, and everything that that entails. We just push the button, get on with it, and leave the European Union. The other uh, option is that we don't... We, the status quo uh, remains, and that's going to be a difficult sell. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a middle way... Uh, where there's a there's a renegotiation we have to but the only difference of course this time is because we've had the European Union referendum the, the referendum on our membership the government has if you like the the will of the people the the consent of the people to give something away but whereas in February when David Cameron held that negotiation he didn't he couldn't give anything away he just had to ask the second point very quickly to make is that Theresa May has done a very canny thing by creating Boris Johnson, three, three offices, three with Liam Fox and David Davis alongside him. It's going to be their responsibility. They ask for it, they're going to have to go and strike the deal and then bring it back. And that's the, that's the really canny thing that the Prime Minister has done. The word canny is, 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 a, is a polite way of putting it. Cynical might be slightly less polite or, or, or even sadistic. Well, the thing is, when this comes back, what, she do, what the Prime Minister doesn't want and what her team doesn't want to happen uh, for the Brexiteers, the Eurosceptics, to say, well, if we did it, we'd get such a better deal. We, we, we'd we'd mm. have trumped everything you've done. And, You're of course, so that's right. exactly what happened to David Cameron. Yes. Was that he came back, waved his piece of paper in the air, and everybody said it was worthless. Never, Neville Chamberlain. This time around, you it's going it. to be their responsibility. They come back, and if we don't like it, tough. And, and you told us it would all be wonderful. You've done the negotiation. Why is it not all wonderful? Exactly. And, and that, that means that... She's clever, isn't she? she? Yeah, she's good. She's very good. On this one, do you, she's do really you, good. Do you, do you find the idea, as I do, of her sitting there for six years smiling without anybody realising that she secretly, secretly despised all of these key Cameron allies? So she hasn't been able to kick him out the door long enough. In fact, I gather that most of her discussions with the people she was dismissing involved her saying, don't let the door smack your ass on the way out. Something, something that has struck me over the last week is that the people who've come in with her and the new Prime Minister, they're serious people. Mm. And... and whether you agree with their politics or you don't agree with their politics and sometimes the, the fault with David Cameron and the team around him was that they were sort of playing at it this time around and, and, and looking the way you know firstly going up to Scotland on mm -hmm. uh, at the end of uh, you know going up to Scotland at the end of last week you know this was a problem David Cameron when he had the Scottish referendum he came out onto the steps of Downing Street and started talking about English votes for English laws whereas Theresa May has actually said you know this is a real issue the prospect of Scotland yeah. leaving the Euro European Union leaving Britain break up of the Union I'm going to fly up there and I'm going to see Nicola Sturgeon and do everything in my power to stop it happening now how long this honeymoon will last Let's wait and see. But there, is, there does seem to be more substance to this regime than the last one. Indeed, there does. They're very briefly, I should remind you, Hagen Clegg shared the house, didn't they? They yes, shared the evening. Yes, yes, they did. Um, I, I, no, no answer to that. They did share it. But the idea, I think, the, 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 the idea that Boris, Dr. Liam Fox, and David Davis could share.
drew some more laughter. <sighs> Theo Ashford, always drawing laughter, whether he intends to or not. Where we examine the rather grim tidings that if you are under 35, you'll be the first generation ever to le- earn less than your parents. First generation since, since we started measuring these things. I suppose if you followed your dad down pit or into mill, then you were just sort of on an equilibrium. Every generation was reflecting the, the, what went on for the one before. But since we actually had a little bit of social conscience in this country and since the workforce managed to collectivise, things have been on an upward curve. I wonder if I've just answered the question of why they're now on a downward curve. Well, because we don't really have much social justice in this country anymore and the workers are no longer collectivised. So let's do some, some answers. So we, we, I've got a few people waiting to talk to me about what it's like, why they think this has happened, and you're still more than welcome. But how would you fix it? How would you fix it? I would, straight away, introduce a law that puts a limit on how much the, the, the top man can earn in a company or the top woman can earn in a company compared to the person on the lowest income. So I would find out how much the uh, human being on reception was earning, and then I would say that the human being who is head of the board is not allowed to earn more than, I don't know, 25 times? Well, the person... So if you say you've got someone on 20 grand downstairs... And then times that, so 200, uh, you'd still be on several, several pounds. Not very good at mental arithmetic. What's 25 times 20? What's 20 grand times 25? Come on. Hello? Someone? Am I doing this all on my own? What's 20,000 pounds times 25? This is ridiculous. So that's half a million quid. That's not enough, is it? That's not enough. For some of these bosses need more. Do they really? Does anyone need to earn more than half a million pounds a year? Or am I already sounding like a communist? And if nobody's allowed to earn more than half a million pounds a year, the property prices might come back under control as well because you won't have people paying stupid money for stupid houses. So there you go. That's, that's the J-O-B 25 multiple, the 25 multiplier. That's in law, okay? I'd limit the amount also by law that you can take out in uh, shareholder dividends. So that if you're running a company, I would say, for example, you can only pay out 50% of the profits to the shareholders who haven't done anything. The other 50% either has to go back into the company or be given to the actual workforce rather than the, 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 the people sitting at home with their shares doing absolutely nothing but getting a payout every time the company performs well. I'd have a higher national living wage. And if you tell me, oh, I can't afford a national living wage, I'd say, well, then you shouldn't be in business. I'd employ some of the rhetoric of the right to introduce the politics of the left. Well, sorry, mate, you're going to have to work hard. What do you mean you can't afford to pay the national living wage? What do you mean you'll go bust? Well, your business model's, your business model's bust. You're not, you're, not, you're not a boss. You might think you're an entrepreneur, but you're not. If you can't afford to pay people £10 an hour, then frankly, you shouldn't be in business. And those people can go and work for someone who can pay them. So national living wage, the, the, the boss... Uh, workforce multiplier, limit... See, all these things seem to me to be doable. But then, possibly to you, I'm beginning to sound like Jeremy Corbyn. Owen's in Southampton. Owen, what would you like to say? Um, uh, the first thing is the, the point your uh, caller made earlier about immigrants. I'm an immigrant, um, and what people kind of forget is... That Boo! When I first there, down with Owen! Boo! You're responsible for all our <laughs> ills, Owen! I want my country back! Boo! Sorry, mate, I just thought it was somewhere else on the schedule. No, but, um, no it's just... When I get here, um, I've been educated somewhere else. The schools I used were in another country. The hospitals, another country. All that paid for. You get my taxing years. You get the years where I'm more productive and, you, and the state didn't pay for me to be here. Mate, I did tell Dave that he was punching himself in the face. It wasn't yeah. really an invitation for you to come and have a crack at him as well. I, I, why, yeah. why do you feel... Why do you feel we've gone into reverse as a nation? I think it's um, the cost of living, really. Because like, you can compare myself to my father. His house cost when he bought it for my family, um, one and a half times his salary. My house would cost me seven and a half times. Yeah. You know, and I know you made the, you made the point about rent controls and all that, but when you look at, when you multiply that factor across every aspect of life, we're not, we can't compare your earning to your father's. You might be earning more, but the cost of living is even greater. But why? Well, I think it's because... Um, why the housing prices? So because banks are allowed to lend a silly amount. Not, not just housing. That's yeah. not the only cost of living, is it? I, I, I had a no, bit of a, I had a strange really moment careful. wandering through Hammersmith yesterday. And I went through the shopping centre there, which is on top of the tube station. And most of the shops were shut, but all the food outlets were open. I could have eaten my way from literally just from the tube station to the exit. I could have had donuts, cookies, pizza. 
uh, sweets. There was a big truck of sweets. Then there was the sort of fruit and nuts truck. There was a McDonald's. There was a Leon. There was, a, I think, a pret a manger They were flogging food at a shop I hadn't seen before. They were, they were, and I'm counting these on my fingers. Did I do those five? I'm up to nine already and I haven't even strained and that, that was in a normal shopping centre the amount of opportunities to hand over a few quid in return for a bucket of sugar and fat means that at the end of that journey through that shopping centre I've got no quids left in my pocket I don't know whether that's relevant but it seems to me we're spending our money on rubbish now in a way that my parents never did well, it's a consumer society, I think they call it. Saying what? You're a consumer society. You're, a cons you're a consumer society. How am I going to make money? Because no, I think it's worse than that. It's more insidious than that. I'm sitting in the boardroom. I think Owen's got a few quid in his pocket. How can I get my hand on that few quid he's got in his pocket that he should be really using to save up for a house? What can I get him? I can't sell him anything because we don't really make anything in this country anymore. So I can't really sell him a car. If I can, the profits are going to go back to Japan or Germany. I can't really sell. What can I sell? I know what I can sell him. I can sell him a bucket of fat and sugar. And then I'll get my four quid out of his pocket pocket and I can divvy it up and pay my person serving the fat and the sugar a pittance and me as a shareholder get get the bulk of it. You know the point you uh, made earlier about um, t multiplier, the time is how much uh, someone can earn at the higher end to the lower end. Yeah. Well, after the recession, I was here in 2008, um, I decided that I wasn't going to work for anybody again, so yeah. I went self-employed. I'm how, a contractor. How did that work out? Yes, yeah, it's, it's probably the best decision I've ever made. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it, because I worry sometimes with the, with the zero, you're obviously not on a zero hours contract, but the absence of sick pay and holiday pay, I wish I could go on PAYE, but they won't let me. The, all the other little protections that you get, pensions, things that they have to pay you to sack you, all those sort of things. It's another reason, actually, why. Oh, that's another reason why. So the earlier caller who was talking about his dad going up through the project manager and the final salary pension scheme, actually, these new contracts of employment, these casual contracts, they're not all zero hours, they can just be project by project, they want to sack you, it's easy. The uh, generation above mine, my dad's generation, you did 20 years at a company, they wanted to get rid of you, you had to pay them a fortune, you had to pay them enough money for them to be able to contemplate early retirement. Proper, hardcore redundancy doesn't seem, I could be wrong, but I don't see much of that around anymore. I really don't. So here are some of the reasons why it's happening. What would the answer be? Have you got anything better than my 25 multiplier? If the, if the, if the poorest paid person on the company is on £20,000 a year, the boss is not allowed to take home or is not allowed to, to gross more than half a million. You times the lowest income by 25, and that is the highest. 03456060973. Higher national living wage, more trade unions. How can we have allowed this to happen to us? Answer, <laughs> once again... All of those people in my profession who've told you that this was actually the way forward. You will be better off if you do nothing whatsoever to stop the rapacious profiteering of the bosses. Anybody suggesting that some people in this country are earning too much while many others are earning too little are indulging in the politics of envy. They are communists who wish you harm. They are even perhaps treacherous and traitorous and deliberately leading this country to hell in a handcart. How the hell can we have ended up without trade union representation in the world? place with adults having to put their hand in the air and ask for permission to go to the lavatory answer once again is the people in my profession who suggest that anybody unhappy at work is unhappy at work through their own fault anybody unhappy with their income is unhappy with their income because they don't work hard enough anybody who's unhappy with their job can go out and get another job see a pattern emerging anywhere yeah look here's something rubbish going on in our country can you tell me why it's happening yeah it's all your fault Oh, actually, it's not my fault, right, then. It's not your fault. I was just kidding. It's the immigrants' fault. Is there any chance at all it's the boss's fault? Don't be ridiculous, you communist, your politics of envy communist. Is there any chance at all that the fact that the boss is taking home five million quid and Doris on reception is taking home 15 grand, is that is that maybe part of the problem? No, you blimmin' politics of envy. <laughs> Honestly. And you know what we do now in Britain, which I don't think we did when I was a kid? We just tug our forelocks, go along with it, and then take on social media to tell all the people that are suggesting maybe maybe you've been sold a pup go on social media and call them all rude names because that'll make you feel better that'll butter your parsnips that'll put food on the table and ensure that your children have a better income than you do being rude on social media about all the people suggesting that possibly the politics of the last 20 years that you've fallen for might be the reason why you haven't got as much money as you thought you'd have at this point in your life and just as you're beginning to think oh my god he's got a point someone else comes along and whispers in your ear immigrants and you're so desperate for it not to be your fault, you bite their arm off. Working out why, 
the uh, under 35s are going to be the first generation ever to learn, earn less than their parents but also maybe we should have done this sooner also wondering what you could do to fix it i've given you some of my suggestions there is room for you to tell me yours if you're quick on 03456060973 about 10 minutes until Sheila Fogarty takes over so do pile in um, and you will get through now i know how frustrating it is all the time to um to try to get through and fail but i promise you because so, so some of the time it's quite easy just because it's hard a lot of the time doesn't mean it's hard all of the time and, and right now if you've got something interesting to say obviously you don't just ring in for the sake of it you know, more than enough of that but uh, uh, you will get through now nadia's in norwich nadia what would you like to say hi james i'd like to say thank you first of all for letting me come on the show you're great you're very welcome you can carry on Okay, so for me, I feel that the reason why the trend has changed between our parents and um, my generation, I guess, with the pay is because it's harder to get a job now. I mean, my parents were telling me when they were younger, they'd walk out of one job and straight into another job, but yes. you know, same day. Where for me, I finished my degree in 2012. Um, I then applied for 40 jobs a week wow. and I've still got nothing. And yet unemployment so is, is, we're constantly being told, at a record low, which is strange, isn't it, given the, the, yes. the, the reality of our experiences? In Norwich, I agree. We've got a great local politician that's actually helped within the last ten, 10 years with, you know, unemployment for the young. So I'm classed, being 34, as too old to be in these schemes to try and get me into work. Mm, left behind. But, I, I agree, but she said, as I, I complained to her, and she said, look, we can only help certain people, we can't help everybody. Um, so I decided to get a master's, came out of my master's in 2014, and I'm still unemployed. So I'm going to go back to uni again for the third time, come out with debt up to my eyeballs. Well, so some people listening might wonder whether you're throwing good money after bad by doing that, and you need to have a complete rethink and, and not go down the, the, the academic route. But then, of course, you'll say to me, well, then I won't earn enough money to repay the loans that I've had to take out to get the degrees that I've already got. The thing is, I find with employers today, what they're doing, when you do the application process, it takes you a good hour or two to put it all together, and then the way they weed people out is ridiculous. But even if you've got one of these jobs, Nadia, you still, according to these figures that we're discussing today, would be worse off in the long run than your parents' generation. Why do you think that is? I mean, I agree with what you're saying about putting, you know, caps on, like, the higher management and stuff. One thing that concerns me, not concerns me, because I'm not sitting on that level, you know, worried about my pay, but, you know, okay, yes, I earn half a million a year if we put that cap on. Yeah. But then their tax is 45% which means, actually, from that money, they're not getting all of that money either. Well, the tax is only 45% on, on the earnings over three over £150,000, and, and almost everybody pays tax. And you, 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 have, to, you have to try... The woman on £20,000 is paying tax on some of her income. Uh, it, 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 and also, you know, you're earning half a million quid a year, you pay your tax, you've still got a hell of a lot more left over than anybody else on the payroll. So, uh, cost of living adjusts accordingly. Yeah. I think... For me, I think it's harder because some people might not have the experience or um, the qualification to get into a certain job and those people are being weeded out. Yeah, if they're giving that opportunity at that entry level, they could actually exceed expectations. But those opportunities are just not mm, there. So you're anymore. still, you're, yeah, nah, they're not there anymore. And, and arguably they haven't been for some time. It's just taken us a while to notice. I wish you well, I really do, in your search for, 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 for employment and, and further education. But um, I, I think you're symptomatic of a much broader uh, experience, much broader problem. Alan in Bristol writes, over the generations, too many people have bought into capitalism and never really questioned it. Now the latest generation are reaping the whirlwind. Jan writes, I think it's Mrs. Thatcher's legacy. You Union bashing and low wage economy kept wages low on the bottom of the ladder. Of course they did, but they were given this wonderful fig leaf. What are you going to? Am I going to get a pay rise, boss? No. Well, hang on. I'm in a union. No, you're not. No, you're not. Unions not recognised. They've got rid of the union. Oh, um, well, how much are you earning? More than ever, mate. I'm laughing seriously. I'm ordering a yacht this week. Well, why can't I have a pay rise? Immigrants, son. Immigrants. You see, I can hire all the immigrants. Well, why can't they have a pay rise? Same reasons you can't. Well, why am I supposed to blame them, then? If they're in the same boat as me, how can they be responsible for me being in this boat? Oh, don't overthink it, son. Just be a bit racist. Seriously, you'll feel better about it. 12.54 is the time. Alex is in Heathrow. Alex, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Yeah, I think a lot of people are overlooking the reason why this generation are not earning more than the previous generation, and that's down to the demographics. 
we have a far smaller group of people in this age group uh, below 35 than above 35 are the baby boomers. So with less people, it creates deflation. And that's why the, the banks and the economy are trying to fight deflation. But if there's, f- if the there's fewer people operating. chasing the jobs, then theoretically they should be getting paid more than the generation that was more populous. Oh, that's, that's how they're trying to fix the problem with immigration. It's not because they're bringing immigrants, immigrants will work for less money, and the local people won't, won't get the job, so there's wage suppression. But there isn't, and and the point you made was that the reason why we're in this situation now is because of the imbalance between the younger generation and the older generation, and now you're saying you're not making any sense at all, actually, if you don't mind me saying so. I think I, think I am. I think the economy is... Well, I know you think you do, but I'm getting paid, you're getting paid less than your parents' generation because there's fewer of you, and also your wages are getting compressed because of immigration. They can't both be true. Uh, they, they are true. The problem is, is the demographics. <laughs> okay. not, enough, not, enough, not enough people being, being born. Right. We're trying to solve that by bringing immigrants in. Yes. When really you should be so if there were more people here. being born, why wouldn't that be repressing wages as well? Uh, the, the economy would be growing. Right, so if the more people are born, the economy grows, but if they arrive here from somewhere else, that suppresses wages? Yes, because they're willing okay. to work for less money. Yes, so, but, but why wouldn't people who've just been born be willing to work, or b- were born here, be willing to work for less money as well, if that is what the employers are offering? Uh, 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 historically, it hasn't happened. Uh, the local people would tend to want, <laughs> tend to want more. <laughs> okay. So people that were born here, they can demand more wages just by dint of being born here. Is that, is that, you're not Dave in a dress, are you, Alex? This is an incredible contribution to the pro. If you were born here, you've got more rights to demand higher wages, have you, than if you just arrived here? Without, without the competition from overseas. Oh, for heaven's sake, it's not competition from overseas, is it? Because you've just said there's a shortage of workers. Uh, oh, there? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for the contribution, and that's what you're up against. So, as someone who simultaneously believes that their income is low because there aren't enough jobs around, but their income is low because there's too many immigrants around as well. Genius. Mike's in Finchley. Mike, what are we doing? Hi, James. Thank you very much for uh, my call. Well, I haven't taken um, it yet. Okay. <laughs> well, there's a couple of points I want to bring up, if you don't mind. You got 47 right. seconds. Right. Okay. Firstly, I don't agree with the suggestion that you've made about how to run a business unless you've actually experienced running a business successfully. Maybe you know it's better to come from people who have run a business. But they've created the economy in which people are earning less than their parents are. So why on earth would we turn to them for advice on how to improve the situation they've created? I wouldn't. I wouldn't tarnish them all as the same. And I would also. Well, you just did. You, you just said they're all no, better qualified. I, 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 no, I just think that if I was to, there's some not the good advice and some with bad advice. It's so well, point. we've gone off a cliff with I the last the two one, calls. So, so the bosses who've the created one. the imbalance and the injustice are the well, only people we can trust. Business? Have you ever, have you ever run a business? I'm running one now. Oh, really? Okay, fine. And the other point is that you know you mentioned about immigration, right? Immigration at the end of the day, I agree with you. It's very unfair, and especially what I heard just now. It's very unfair the comments made about immigrants, and it's, it's absolute nonsense. But I, I also do feel because you do bring it up regularly that not all of us who aren't immigrants are or treat immigrants unfairly. But I have seen some people from ethnic minorities being anti-Semitic to other ethnic uh, And I've seen some people who aren't from ethnic minorities being anti-Semitic to other ethnic minorities, and I've seen some people who are Jewish being racist to people who aren't Jewish, and I've seen some people who are indigenous, whatever the hell that means, who aren't racist at all. Your point is, well, I'm sure it was great when you decided to ring in. It's coming up to one o'clock, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, feeling the frustration yet again of people who are effectively determined, determined as turkeys, to cling to the notion that there's nothing stupid at all about voting for Christmas. Because as we will now end every programme until the end of time by observing, it is a hell of a lot easier to fool people than it is to persuade them that they've been fooled. I'm James O'Brien.